so good afternoon. I do not use uh, Apple at my university. We are on a standard PC, so is there someone who could help me? So the slides show on the full screen here on the computer, because they get us a small one. Is it could help me to follow the presentation? No. <laughs> <laughs> we're all, you know, just not bits in practice, we're still in theory. You know, the practice is somehow is very problematic. Okay, so. Uh, I'm afraid to touch you, otherwise, you will to disappear completely. So, first of all, I'd like to thank to the new Litter Observer, uh, Edina, especially, and Yelena for organizing this session and inviting me to uh, Moscow. I would also like to. Uh, 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 knowledge the super I got from Sergey and other staff here for the wonderful organization of this. Of this. I'm look quite happy that I'm here with you because an hour ago with the lunch break I left this place and then I wasn't allowed to come back here. <laughs> but I used my passport and the program and said I am speaking, so finally the police official let me in. So I can be here, you don't have to go on the you know, bridge, so I would be... What language did you use to persuade her? I chose to use Russian now, ah, so it's a little, 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 little. <laughs> So that's this thing. Uh, and uh, I was invited to speak about the uh, virtual cities, and I must admit that I'm not an expert on virtual cities. But uh, it was a real challenge for me. Uh, you know, teaching for uh, 15, 20 years on uh, urban geography, I'm an urban geographer. Actually, I said, aren't theories which we use virtual cities, are not they virtual reality? So then I said, probably we should not link the virtual reality only with the cyberspace as we do at present time. Then the final thing for the introduction. I'm amazed that uh, this room is on Saturday afternoon, full of people, <laughs> <laughs> at the end of the conference. So this is a great surprise, and this also allows me to move to uh, the first of my slides. And that's uh, what I see in my country. I see it apparently here. I saw it also in Hungary and Poland, other Central European countries. It's a growing interest on in what is going on in cities, in urban places. And I try to ask myself why there is this growing interest. Because it wasn't like this 10 years ago. I don't know how in Moscow, but certainly not in my city. And uh, first of all, I think that uh, it has something to do with the transformation or transition from the communism. And I think people are preoccupied first, you know, in the first decade with this general transformation of the politics and economy and so on. Then with changes in the social practices and social structures. And they didn't pay much attention to the daily life and what is happening probably in our daily neighborhoods. The other thing is that uh, during the transformation, we first did the very general things, and then once, you know, it takes time, it takes 10, maybe 15 years when it changes, and the, you know, the politics, economy, and social practices really start to imprint on the cities. So it's the right time, actually, to look on the cities. Uh, then also, I think it has something to do with the generation shift. It's mostly young people who are interested in what's going on in the cities. Because they are dissatisfied with the national, but also local politics. They want to do something about the places where they live. And uh, they have, uh, I think, courage to go and speak. So it must do something with this. And probably, because it's about the city, that's where our daily life goes on, they probably also believe that they might do something which is a little bit more difficult to do in the national level. So you can do something in a city and in the neighborhood. So uh, there might be a link to cyberspace, because I have a PhD student, uh, two of, from my group, two of them are members of a watchdog uh, institution which is called Prague Watch. And Prague Watch is looking on a, you know, different cases in Prague, what is happening, what is controversial, and so on. And other PhD students in our institute are supporting, uh, supporting this activity. And they are using the cyberspace, the internet, to communicate in a way which Caroline was speaking about. Not really research, but online communication about all these happenings in the city. So for me, the challenge is also actually, uh, how can urban theory help us to understand what is happening now in the cities? To take evaluate what is happening, and probably also to simulate kind of the normative propositions, what to do with our cities, to look forward. So that's for the start. Uh, most of my research was on the post-communist city. So I will start to explain what I mean by post-communist city and what I think is very important about post-communist city. And then I will really address it to it. Um, 
for me, the post communist city is a city which is uh, in a constant change. So it's not something that is stable. I think all cities are in constant change. But if you look on the post communist cities, it's extremely radical change, a revolutionary change. We could say maybe at the beginning revolutionary and then we could get to evolutionary adaptations. But looking, you know, on the built up environment, Many, many revolutions are still going on, probably not such as in the politics, but in the city state. You know, thinking about cities, I always imagine cities in, let's say, two aspects which are dialectically related. Being an urban geographer, one of them is a spatial structure or spatial organization or socio-spatial organization. Something that we might imagine as a more physical, despite it includes also people, thoughts and so on. But behind this, there are principles and mechanisms which, you know, create cities, transform cities, reshuffle cities. And try to look at this picture, which, tra which tries to show, you know, flows of investment to city centre and outer city districts and to the socialist city and the post-socialist city. The flows are different. There's the patterns. But why they are different? Because there was very different political and economic logics under the socialism and under the capitalist city, or now the post-socialist city. What really changed in the first use of tradition was this logic of the parameters of the game. You know, we got from totalitarian to more democratic regime, from central planning to more market decentralized economy. And this change was quickly done in nine countries in five years. In some countries, it takes longer. You can admit that probably the democracy is not as democratic as you would expect, but still, there's very much different situation from how was it 25 years ago. I was in former Soviet Union twice, so I can uh, I, I can compare. So for me, it's very important, you know, this change first, changing the principles of the game, and then how this is imprinted in the urban landscape. Uh, so, uh, you know, some of my colleagues uh, uh, in Western Eastern Europe, they are telling me, why you are still speaking about uh, city in transition, about the post-socialist city? And because actually transition is over. You know, all the major reforms were done in the 1990s. So we should speak and use the best of theories and look on the globalization, no liberalism and so on. And I'm saying it's not finished. The struggle of transformation is still going on. The 1990s, at least in my country, were about this general political and economic transformation. But once you change the rule of the game, then the extras start to play. You know, individuals, household, firms, uh, organizations, and so on. And this might be a generation, you know, changing the social practices. And then it only becomes imprinted in the urban space, in the built up environment in uh, the land use, in the socio-spatial structures and so on. How long does it take to change the city? It's physical, social environment, because of emotional environment. This takes ages. It's, it's probably more than a generation. And this is what is at play now. So I'm speaking about the multiple transitions, and we shouldn't do. It's something what I call new path dependencies. Uh, you know, our society is taking facing uh, multiplicity of critical junctures. You know, that's situations when we have to make choices. And choices which will impact cities, actually, for decades, for generations. Uh, quite often, we, you know, when uh, we are speaking about the present times, we are referring to, you know, legacies from the socialism, how the present actually is based in the socialism and so on. But I think most, the major substance of the transformation actually is something what I would call path breaking and path shaping because we want to break ourselves from the communist path and we want to establish actually a new path of the development. Something, let's say capitalism and democracy or like capitalism and democracy. And I think this path shaping is something very, very important because new developments which we witness in our cities, sprawl, segregation and so on, these are the new paths or they have a new ground field. That's a new path how we actually treat our students. And how we might create something when in 20 years from now we would call locking or path dependence. You know, in my city, uh, sprawl is one of the major issues for some academicians, but not for the general public and politicians. 
And I'll speak about the uh, correlation on because once you get distributed activities in space, physically, you know, physically embodied in a space, then you will not change it. Once you did it in the United States, then it's very difficult to change it what you did 30, 40 years ago. So actually, what I think is the role for us as a, a, a human science, social science researchers, and activists, and so on, is actually to anticipate what is going on, to critically evaluate what is going on, probably also to, 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 set, to have some normative suggestions what to do with these developments. Because we should pay attention to such developments which might be avoided if there are some alternatives which might be more sustainable. I think we have to provide a forward loop to what might go in our countries. Uh, the example on, uh, on a straw, uh, uh, by straw I understand spatial fragmentation, leapfrogging, low density, spatially extensive drone, and so on. And the straw, once it develops, it brings irreversible changes in the settlement structures. And we all know that it's less sustainable. It brings, it's energy inefficient, it brings social exclusion, it has a higher economic cost, and it has a more compact development, and so on. Look on this picture. This shows that the new developments happened around the Prague or on the edges of Prague, that the new developments, hundreds of small places, no connection to railway lines. We have a you know quite heavy structure of railway lines. Very fragmented. 40% population growth in the last 10 years here, right in this suburban block. And that's something what is shaping our future. Segregation. We have a new places ranging from gated areas or gated communities to localities of social exclusion. Whether they are related to gypsies, Roma, or uh, some foreign guest workers, that's, uh, that's a whole range of things. We have a signs of future state of segregation. You know, some of these politicians are even experts with them. It's a little now, but if this goes on after 10, 10 years, we'll be in a state of segregated society. So we should think in advance. What we are creating now are structural conditions which will impact, you know, coming generations, and we should be aware of them. So we are now, as I would argue, on the critical junctures in which new post-communist power dependencies are initiated, and we should be aware now, not in 10 years' time, when there will be threat to our cities and our society. These are just a few pictures of, uh, you know, landscapes in our cities and mostly residential segregation, which I put here. So you will say, you will see, you know, guided places, derelict uh, inner city housing, some of the derelict housing estates, uh, this uh, orange building that's a container housing for Roma, which were located from the central city to the city outskirts. Uh, uh, being in, a, in Moscow, I put here uh, new, new slides. That's the center of Karlovy Barry. It's actually a place where the Russian, the Russian rich, they outbid the local people, even the local upper class, because they have a high purchasing power. Of course, they have their business operations, so they need also, you know, the people of the working class working for them, 12 hours in the shops and serving Russian customers there. And uh, this development has a has with 140 apartments. And actually, all of them are sold to Russians, Russian speaking. In, in a city, there five percent of population is Russian speaking. Uh, Brenda, uh, we spoke about the Vietnamese. This, uh, this, you know, this picture on the left-hand side that's the large Vietnamese economic space in Prague. Daily, in ordinary days, three, four thousand people in this place. On a week, we five to seven thousand, both uh, Vietnamese but also local local population. Uh, this is a picture from an uh, automobile textile uh, factory. Uh, we have a huge number of guest workers coming from Ukraine, Moldova. Uh, uh, they are coming from uh, Mongolia, from Bulgaria, Romania, working for low, low wages, building in such working class dormitories. This one looks nice because it's been recently redone. But formerly, it was a farm building, a big ground. So we them for that. They have a one kitchen upper floor, one on down floor, very poor conditions in which they live. So now I will come to the virtual realities. It's major, major change of what I'm going to speak about. And I, I, I have to deal with it in some way. And I ask first myself that there are virtual cities. And whether they have significant effects on real cities and urban life. And also why we speak at present about the virtual cities. And I said myself, it must to do something with the cyberspace. It must to do something with the situation where a large part of the daily life of the population is now realized in cyberspace. That's what you were discussing before. It's now, in my country, it's a kids 
in the sixth, seventh grade when they have a smartphone and their life is in cyberspace. It might be HD students when they want to meet for lunch in a canteen in, you know, in my building. They call themselves through Twitter or Skype and so on, not telephone. So they are all the time constantly online. And the other thing is that, uh, and how this change at these social trends is in relation to, to cities. And the other thing is that much of what we at present learn about cities and urban life doesn't come from the direct experience. It comes from the representation in the cyberspace. I'm doing you know, seminar papers with my students and related to, the, to, to theory. So how theory can help us to understand concrete places in the city. And after years, I found that most of the new seminar papers were based just on information gathered from the cyberspace instead of going to the place itself. So now I have a couple of students, and they have to do both works and confront it. Because sometimes the cyberspace representation is very different from what they will actually observe in the place. Yes. So the question is uh, whether the growing growth of cyberspace and social life significantly reshape cities. So we need to substantially consider existing urban theories. That's the question for myself. Or maybe for ourselves. And then uh, uh, virtual cities. Uh, I've asked whether there are virtual cities beside the computer games or something else. Of, uh, it resembles me all basic computer game. And I ask myself what we mean by virtuality. So at least virtual for me is an artificial socially constructed object that usually displays or represents some key qualities of reality in which we live or imagine to live. It is a model of reality. But maybe it is reality itself as well. But model of this one which is outside of the cyberspace. Virtual can be a representation of present and past, but very importantly, it also is an imagined picture of uh, fiction of future. It can be used for the anticipating of future cities, and I think virtual reality is very much about this. Mm -hmm. And the virtual can be contested, shaped, and reshaped by subject, users. It provides a dialectic feedback between perception and representation. It simulates creativity, because we perceive what is in cyberspace. What is uh, presently there are these representations, and they can affect, you know, they influence our perception, and actually the steps which we do in the reality itself. That's how, you know, our steps are more informed by the cyberspace than the direct, uh, direct uh, uh, experience. So the cyberspace, I think before it goes to it, it's a network of uh, uh, technologies, network of users, but also the social activities, information, discussions, games, and, and, and so on. Right? It's a global network, but interestingly, it's, uh, for most people, it's heavily localized or regionalized. So they're globally linked, but much of the communication, at least, that's my suggestion, comes locally, but with the global connection in some cases. And it provides new ways of social organization and new bonds of social experience. And now about the cyberspace and the urban experience and theory. The first thing which I think is important, uh, I think we are still in the start, and it's difficult to anticipate actually what it will bring to the cities and also to the urban theory, is that the increasing share of social communication experience in life is going on in cyber cyberspace. And I think the important thing for me, at least when I think about this, is that the qualities of reality represented in cyberspace influence the decisions which have effects on the outside world world outside of the cyberspace, something what we might call the real world in which we behave. And uh, I think that's not all the representations which we use are in cyberspace. Our traditional theories might be downloaded on uh, articles and so on. But I think the cyberspace is present uh, most effective and attractive environment for the communication. So actually, a uh, number of young people and my students, they more learn from what is available in cyberspace than from the academic discussions in the classes. This is, this is very important. So it's a question whether you know, the traditional theories and a way of communication still have some effects on people who will be deciding in 10 or 15 years about the lives in our cities. Not all representations in cyberspace are virtual realities. But I was thinking that if I look on the cyberspace as a whole, on the aggregate of what is available there, on the plurality of things which are available, then I think this, uh, you know, this aggregate creates another world, which is a reflection of the world. 
indeed are living in it, we are informed by it, and so on. So all these aggregate in cyberspace actually means the virtual reality. And the virtual reality is dynamically evolving, as it's constantly shaped and reshaped by actions of participating subjects, participating subjects. So for me, cyberspace to some extent behave as virtual reality. Uh, another question for me appears, what is the politics of representation in cyberspace? How much hegemonic discourses go through the cyberspace? And the other thing is, but there is the plurality of representations of cities and urban life in the cyberspace. So, what is the information which comes to us? And I think something between this, because there is both hegemonic discourses coming, for instance, through the newspapers now in, on, on the web, which most people read. But on the other hand side, you can get to alternative views on it. But at least for me, very important is looking on the communities of immigrants, is how discourses about immigrants, drama, shape, xenophobia in my country. And these are discourses outside you know, the rigorous academic discussion. A very, very influential how we perceive our states and how it's imprinted in the segregation landscapes in cities, for instance. So the question is whether uh, the virtual reality in cyberspace could displace or replace the probably more rigorous insights of urban studies and urban theory. And I'm not sure whether I'll be able to answer it. And now I bring to what I promised in the abstract, and that's uh, the two virtual realities from the traditional academic discourse. And I will really oversimplify. I look on the two schools of urban thought, the Chicago 80 years old and the Los Angeles 20 years old. Yes. <laughs> so just a quick overview. Uh, Chicago School keywords urbanism as a way of life, Louis Wirt, uh, social ecology, models of spatial structure. I think everyone knows, so I can quickly go further. So what we can learn from, uh, uh, from the uh, human ecology of Chicago School is that city is a socio-ecologic system which is constantly moving towards the equilibrium. It's quite it's disturbed, it's moving all the time towards equilibrium. That is city growth and evolution of urban structures governed by division of labor and differentiation of functions. That spatial structure is natural outcome of competition for location in urban space. That concentration and segregation leads to the formation of natural areas. And that uneven development of urban spatial inequalities are outcomes of evolutionary logic of urban growth under capitalism. And I must say, this theory is the very popular in urban geography in my country, among planners, among large part of the sociologists, and so on. And it very much resonates with the way how we approached capitalism 50, 20 years ago. And still, this actually uh, politically, how it's called, justifies the inequalities which are growing our cities. So, post central school, and I'll, I'll make probably some adjustments. It's very, very reduction. Socio-spatial dialectics between space and social structures. I think this was also in the Chicago School, but it's already based on the critical uh, social science standpoints. It very much paid attention to globalization and economic restructuring, something which wasn't there during the Chicago. It was growing say now we have restructuring and we have a global so it wasn't there. And this is the presentation. Probably not here so much on the cyberspace, but at least through media powerful hegemonic discourses and so on. And itself, I think essential school is very much about the politics of representation, how to get themselves on a, you know, the academic uh, playground. And some of the key things which I do from the essential schools is that the urbanization is occurring in a quasi-random field of opportunities, that capital touches down as if by chance on a parcel of land, ignoring opportunities on intervening lots. Uh, from this dear the article on, uh, on the new urbanism. So the outcome is a pedo-capitalism, city which looks as a patchwork pattern, characterized by random type of spatial structures and processes related to global local interplay. So important is that processes which shape cities operate outside of the city itself, and important are the sources and politics of representation which also shape cities. And I think it has already something to do with what is happening in the cyberspace and with the virtuality. Comparing these two schools, you know, 60 years difference, Chicago School, modern industrial city, Los Angeles, postmodern post industrial, Chicago urban growth, Los Angeles urban restructuring, Chicago School centrality as a basic principle of spatial organization of city, Los Angeles multiplicity of processes which organize urban space, 
and recombination of these principles. Chicago School Concentric Zones, Los Angeles Patchwork Spatial Pattern, and Chicago Order, Regularities, Laws, Functional Relations, Ecologic System, Los Angeles Randomness, Disorder, Multinational Centralism. And uh, something what I found is very important for me, I don't know whether I grasp it correctly, but it's my interpretation on the dynamics of spatial organization. I see the Chicago as a model of the city when uh, there were the heydays of the you know, industrial drought. It was based on urban, regional, economy and society. The, it worked as a kind of the large factory. It got the inputs and outputs, but most of the you know, city was organized around the internal economic logic, political control and social unity of a growing urban region, maybe with a lot of inequalities in it. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, so because, you know, uh, but, uh, you know, Los Angeles, it's about something a little bit different. We have a global economy. We have a parallel global and local world. What we get in the cities are global investments which selectively come to the existing cities on these individual specific blocks. So they have a very specific location and behavior. And the outcome is this random networks of new localities and hotspots in uh, the urban landscapes. You know, from Yuri Musil, years, years ago, I was taught that in Chicago, it's like if you, you know, you throw a stone and there are circles on the border, that's the immigrant community. You know, you need logic. If you look on the Los Angeles, it's like a public fountain. Something coming here, there, there, and we do not see logic behind it. So, I don't know whether the interpretation is correct, but that's my view. And now, coming to the last part of my presentation on new realities and new models, with question mark. So the questions I ask is whether Chicago Los Angeles schools are relevant for the understanding of urban development in the age of cyberspace. Whether they can contribute to the understanding of urban development in post-communist city. And whether we do need new theories of models of uh, urban development. And uh, this picture, that's a Prague. And it combines uh, two layers. The map at the bottom that's, a, I would say, traditional socio-ecological view. You see the concentric zones. You can see, you know, how the population social status is changing to the city center, to the city outskirts, and so on. But the second layer are particular places where something is happening because of the invest investment is touching down right here in these places. Gentrification, condominium, brownfield redevelopment, water court redevelopment, new retail zones, out of center of these clusters, suburbs, and so on. And some of these new places, they are in total contradiction with what was there before. If you look on the new wealthy suburbs, they are coming from the countryside, where we've got the peasants or working class people traveling to the city. So people with high social status coming to places with low social status. You know, some of the neighborhoods very close to the city, which are valuable for the capital investments, you get again contrast, you know, contrast of functions which were existing under the socialist city and which are coming to the places now. So for me, we are getting, you know, new <laughs> Los Angeles type of you know, global investments coming on the landscape which was created through this more Chicago type of urban development. So, for me, uh, what we are getting is a recombination of past and present, the combination of uh, Chicago and uh, Los Angeles. So, the contemporary city, the contemporary urban development, uh, is a recombination of both of these, you know, modes of the urban growth or urban change. And I think, at least in post socialist countries, we should always have in mind that the urban development is conditioned by socio economic and territorial organization of its time. And the organization was different before 1989 from what is here at present. In my country, we've got capitalism between 1948. So we've got from capitalism to communism and back to the capitalism. And you can see all these layers mixed up in a city. So the landscapes of cities which developed during periods with different political and economic conditions or regimes, they mirror multiplicity of socio-economic logics. That's what we see in a city. Uh, so the city form reflects both the long-term development path, the inertia in the you know, built-up environment, segregation and so on, and also the contemporary practices, new socio-spatial formations under the new regime. So Chicago and Los Angeles mutually coexist as a past and present in our urban landscapes. Last two slides. And now cyberspace. <laughs>
You know, if I think about people who look on the cyberspace and what they do with cities, they are using such things like having virtual tours through cities. You know, you can have a 360 view on the old town square in Prague, you can do the same in the US square in Moscow, you can go to Dubai and so on, so people entertain themselves. They can be from their office on several places in one evening. Uh, that's actually what they understand as virtual space and how they can enjoy cities. Some very accurate physical images, uh, uh, um, but isn't there something more about cities? So I think also cyberspace is used as a marketing tool, as a government communication platform towards citizens and investors. I think my city is using it very dully, I cannot show it to you. But it's also an environment for citizens of organizational resistance. There's the Prague Watch and a number of places here, but they see it as controversial developments and they communicate it between themselves and the other population. So for me, cyberspace provides easy access to information which otherwise wouldn't be readily available. And it's a tool which uh, allows actively construct, provide, and share information. That's why I think it's very, very uh, attractive for people. And I think uh, that now, actually, nearly all is in cyberspace, except green cities. Those cities which are shaped by investments to build up environment, by jobs and employment, daily movements of people from home to schools, workplaces, services, and so on. So it's still an imprint there. But is the representation that shape our thoughts, but in real life is still going on outside of the cyberspace. So I still have this question in mind, whether can or should virtual reality in cyberspace displace or replace our monitors inside urban studies and urban theory? I won't answer it, I think it cannot. <laughs> and that's the last slide. And this is important for me as the uh, agenda for urban uh, research. Uh, so, what is more important, you know, consider for uh, answering what is happening in the city? Is it the people, which uh, probably the Chicago school would suggest? Or is it the capital? Or is it the presentations? And what is the role of the politics, especially local politics in the place? And there are two things which I, I would uh, emphasize in the present day post-communist city. One of them is the position in the global order, the external condition. And uh, I think it pays so little attention to the power imbalance between local and global capital, to the position in the global production networks. Number of NGOs fighting against some of the practices in urban development in Prague. They look at the local politics, but they know very little about actually globalization in the cities. We constantly speak about this issue. And this brings uneven urban and region development and social spatial inequalities. And the second thing that the local response to it, and I think in our country, I guess in a number of other socialist countries, it has something to do with the balance between individual freedom and collective responsibilities. What we did was uh, the deregulation you know, decision making to actors in marketplace. So individuals got the freedom, families, firms, and so on. And they very much appreciate this. We decentralized the decision makers to decision making to local governments, very fragmented local governments. But the real life now goes in you know, city regions. But our city regions are governed, in the case of Prague, 250 local governments, for instance. Very fragmented, which is very convenient, actually, for the external topics of to negotiate with them individually rather than with the whole. So what we are getting is a capitalism that globalized investment circles and localized decision making. And what we see are vested interests of local politicians, which try to meet demands of international investors. And what we also get is a politics of mutual delegitimation between political parties, but also between political parties and NGOs, between a number of actors. And because they delegitimize themselves, they are not able to create a coalition which would there be as a public force against you know, the external investors coming to the city. So fortunately, what we are getting is increasing local resistance but younger people, backed by the global awareness and exchange of knowledge, ideas, and practices, with mutual support in the cyberspace. So cyberspace might have a effect to this resistance to the global capitalism and local vested interests of some corrupted politicians at all. Thank you very much. <laughs> First of all, thanks for the brilliant presentation. And uh, I just want to go back to the comparison between Los Angeles School and Chicago School. 
if I understood you correctly, the very nature of urban object tells to a searcher what kind of urban theory he, should, he or she should prefer. Does it really mean that differences between Chicago and Los Angeles determine somehow the difference between Los Angeles school and Chicago school? Because Chicago school is based on this very strong ecological metaphor, and Los Angeles school is based on this metaphor, Marxist metaphor of superstructure and infrastructure. And does it really mean that you cannot describe Chicago in terms of superstructure and infrastructure, and you can't describe Los Angeles in terms of social ecology? Could I just quickly add something to the question? Uh, I think that Chicago versus uh, Los Angeles also has something to do with, with uh, a city that in which the, the center played such an important role for a long time. In other words, centripetal versus centrific, centripetal, centripetal. Anyway, cities. Yeah, whereas Los Angeles doesn't have a center. Essentially developed, moving in different directions, and we, one, of this, one of the impressions that people have of Los Angeles, especially if they come to that city, is that they don't understand how to navigate it because there is no city center. So I think that that plays a very important role also in the distinction between Chicago, a much more traditional city, and LA. So first, of course, theories reflect moving realities. And I think that was a very substantial move from the industrial city to the post-industrial city. From a city which was economic and socially organized in a you know, city region, and a city which is now affected by the social economic organization, which is on the global scale, at least for a number of activities, and those which are powerful now are selecting places. And the city that they will come, into which place and city. And this must be reflected by the urban theory. And that's, I think, major difference. And that's what the Chicago School couldn't do, because the reality was different. And I do not think, I do not see them in a contradiction. They are witnessing, you know, the evolving urban structure, and there are things which we can learn from from both. And uh, if you would uh, say that there is more political economy in uh, uh, Los Angeles, then this also came later on to urban studies. And I think political economy can come, can add, and uh, be in a some way reconciled with uh, some of the ideas from, uh, from the uh, Chicago School. But I do not want to come to, to, to this with detail. And the final thing is. I don't know. Because the uh, conferences of the Association of American Geographers go from the city to city, so I was once in Los Angeles and I was once in Chicago, I had no problem to navigate myself in Los Angeles. And uh, the conference was in the center, I lived in the center, and I see the center, but there are many other centers, so it's a polycentric metropolis. But isn't Chicago present day also yes, polycentric? True. So but the origins, I think, originally, certainly, the sense of Chicago, or I think it still is, that it has a city, a historical city center. Los Angeles doesn't have a historical city center. I guess I was thinking because it, historical. Because it hasn't such a history and a very different history. If you will come to district European cities, we will get even deeper in history and more of the imprint of the histories and the you know, socio-economies and political situations which influence the cities. Yeah, so I very much appreciated your paper, and I think you're completely on the right track of being fascinated by the post-socialist, uh, post-communist city, and that that is a continual ev evolutionary process of, of path dependence, really, that um, gives it uh, a very lively research um, setting and will always be. I just wanted to pick up on the Chicago-Los Angeles um, issue because, in a way, I have a privileged position because I was trained at Chicago and am in continuous interaction with people who participated, at least in the last phases of the Chicago School, and lived in Southern California for 30 years and participated very much with the UCLA and USC uh, geographers and, and urban sociologists. And, um, it's, it's, um, it, it has become a reified distinction. Uh, the Chicago, so-called Chicago School was much more diverse 
than people are picking it up and making it into. Uh, Louis Wirth and um, Everett Hughes concentrated on the separate worlds that made up Chicago, parallel worlds, distinctive worlds, and somehow it has been absorbed in, in, as one of the research, um, um, not schools, but segments, uh, has become labeled as the Chicago School. And similarly, in Los Angeles, um, the, the Los Angeles departments are filled with people who were trained in the Chicago School and approach Los Angeles uh, very much as their various mentors did in the variations of the Chicago School. And so um, I, I, I just communicate that there has been a, a reification in part by uh, marking off space and the academic inclination to constantly set oneself off from others uh, to create a Chicago school and then to create a, a Los Angeles school. Um, and uh, my colleagues at Berkeley, by the way, uh, created a manuscript based on the Berkeley school. Um, and they withdrew the title uh, at the last minute because of the, for me, unsavory connotation of that kind of empire um, building. And so I'll just warn you that empirically, it is much less of a clear distinction than it has emanated to be. And indeed, the, the original um, uh, ongoing specific histories of those places and the time they were developed in history is, is critical to what actually went on. Um, and and um, uh, th that's, um, I think, the critical aspect rather than uh, the paradigms. Вы сможете so can I answer or Steve first? Okay, so perhaps you'll answer this question. Okay, so I'll answer the T1. Uh, thanks for the comments. Maybe I should explain why I came to this issue. I came to it because my colleagues in urban geography and urban sociology and planning in my country are predominantly occupied by you know the theory of the Chicago School of Social Ecology. And they are very neglecting or do not want to use a critical uh, social theory. They don't want to use the political economic approaches because that's something that resembles them in this country. So a very conservative standpoint. So I was amazed by after 20 years, you are still based on the theory from 1920s. You do not reflect the other things. So this is way how I try to explain what is the difference and that the Los Angeles ideas can be used to conceptualize what is going on in our cities. Because there, there, there always are the parallel worlds. The question is what is producing these parallel worlds. And you know, for me, in our cities at present time, the important is that the processes, the causes, the conditions are now in global space, are outside of the local political control. If I look on the immigrant uh, guest workers, places of concentration, that this is produced by the position of our firms in the global production networks. It's this, you know, how the guest workers are employed is decided by the companies, which are international, transnational companies, and uh, what kind of jobs they are offering in the Czech Republic. You know, the labor-intensive uh, work for, for low salaries. And, of course, how this is mediated by the national government, but also the local cities. So, the situation is geographically somewhere else than it was eight years ago. And I think this is how it helps me to, you know, understand the shift. Steve, yeah. Right, so, this is, this is a slightly long comment, I'm afraid, but it sort of follows on from what Harvey's saying. Uh, another way of thinking about these is less about the schools than about. Um, <laughs> less about the schools than about thinking 
what is happening in those cities to produce uh, forms of knowledge. So, um, so what, what you can say about Chicago at that time is not that it isn't global and not that it isn't in transition. In fact, what's, what the Chicago school are encountering, and if you think about Zorbao and some of those stories about you know, the deep ethnographies of the fights that are on the streets between Persians and other people and all those kind of things, is actually that you're capturing Chicago at a moment of transition and globalization. That, it, that it's in a particular moment of that. Similarly, one could argue that what's happening in Los Angeles is it's a profound anxiety about becoming Mexican and a particular form of globalization which is through Hollywood. Right? So, so these are both, so this is, again is, uh, I mean, you've got post industrialization, globalization, but again, Los Angeles in transition, producing a form of knowledge. So my, my provocation to you is, what's the, what's the Prague School? What are you going to produce that is going to change our view of how we understand cities in transition and moments of globalization? How can you interfere with these two cities and tell them what happened in those cities at a moment of transition and a specific relationship with globalization? Globalization doesn't mean everywhere connected to everywhere. It means specific entanglements of stretched out spatial relations, right? What's Prague telling Chicago and Los Angeles? I'm not sure whether Chicago was globalizing, at least in a sense how some of us understand globalization at the present time. You've got the global migration flow, but the question is, was the production globally organized? Maybe the sales of goods, but not the production. So this connectivity in production, I'm not, I'm not sure, I'm not a historical urban geographer, but uh, you know, most, most of the production, consumption, detail in the present time Prague is globally organized. If I look on the enterprises in, uh, in, uh, in uh, industries, if I look on the uh, producer services, if I look on the retail, most of uh, what is going on concerning the employment, sales, products is globally organized, not the local ones. So that's, that's, that's my answer. Maybe I'm, I'm wrong. I mean, it, sorry, there, there's, that's the view of globalization, right? The, I mean, one of the heuristics of globalization is it's local at every point. I think uh, Chicago, when it's Chicago, before it becomes Chicago, uh, over 38 nations involved in Chicago, even when it's a very small place, uh, stuff is coming from Canada, being exported through New York, back to Europe. So yes, you have global, global relations and global, uh, global networks running through Chicago, even when it's only a few thousand people. So, Chicago starts by being global. It goes through waves of globalization. These, these are moments of these particular kinds of things. So, so yes, no, it starts globally. It's a starting thing, but flows of people and goods, not the organization yet. No, the organization yet, no. Yeah. You think about Prague School, right? And what then we Rock call Prague School, school. Yeah. <laughs> you know, those of us who are in literature and cultural history, we think of the famous Prague School from the 1920s, which is a continuation of Russian formalism, Roman Yakovsen comes to Prague. In other words, completely different connotations, which I thought I was. Actually, there's an argument there, you know, probably not famous, <laughs> but from a different <laughs> Concerning, you know, urban studies, and I'm not speaking only about Prague, but I'm speaking at least hopefully for some of the former communist cities. The major difference is that if you look on these theories of Western cities, they always got one thing which was the same as the capitalist system. So the rules of the game were similar or more or less similar, stable. You know, and they produce certain way of behavior for individuals, households, firms, and so on. You've got technological change, you've got the geographical shift to globalization, and so on, which were, of course, transformations, which meant to gradual implication, you know, in the space of the city, and so on. Technologies, political, economy, and the global sphere, and so on. But if you look to Eastern Europe, or to places which go through the communism, you've got shifting political regimes. And this is very important because this intervening variable wasn't there in Western urbanism. And this is how I want to pay attention to this thing, that the three layers of the multiple transitions, the rules of the game, social practices, and imprint of urban structure, 
because if the rules of the game were significantly different, if you change that, then you need a generation to change the social practices, then it only comes to the urban landscapes. So you know the layering of the geological metaphor is very, very substantially more radicalized in the post-socialist cities. And I think this is not the way to which I think the uh, Western probably urban theory paid too much attention because you haven't faced you know, this radical change. And it has also something to do with these new power dependencies. As precisely as they, they are emerging because the basic principles of the game change. And now we are thinking this is naturally changing our way of behavior. We think the market, freedom, you know, social ecology type of the market, and uh, I don't know, spontaneous evolving city. And it's bring, bringing natural outcomes in the segregation of cities, division of function, and so on. But we are forgetting that capitalism also has a the role of the local public government and the regulation of capitalism. And the regulation is here not only to react, but also to anticipate and forecast, think about the society in which you want to live. And I think we shouldn't forget about this discussion, but we did in the past 20 years. So, so two last questions. One will Mike, I'm sorry, I'm just this, and that's all. Uh, you know, it's a nice question that you yeah. You know, listen to you, right? somehow it's very pleasing because you see this almost the same picture. What happens to Moscow and other Russian cities? People go into suburbs, uh, the most you know, rich and you know, well to do people go instead not to the center but from the center to the park and many other things. And uh, listening to your talk about cyberspace, uh, I think that somehow very strangely now, in the say, communist. Um, space, so to say, the Soviet space, you know, not only the Soviet Union, but all West, uh, East European countries involved um, in this dramatic uh, situation. There was a kind of parallel culture, a kind of cyberspace, some imagination, what is the West, how people do live there. So the idea that all respected people should live somewhere in their own house in the suburbs which was taken from rare Western films that were shown, from all kinds of talks that people go into to draw. At least I'm speaking about Russian situation. All, all others imaginary uh, pictures of a normal life probably somehow are reflected in this very specific way of city development. Uh, I would say this is a psychological problem as Russian artists, you know, created their own ways just looking at the plates of uh, list of plates, you know, illustrations of contemporary Western art, you know, which was brought somehow from somewhere. So that was a very crazy ideas about different ways of life in the open world, uh, and probably it's very much seen in this, um, you know, the logics of development uh, of urban development in these last 20 years, so, subconsciously. In a way. So the idea of you know of modern life and how should people live in what type of houses and how it should be developed in this in this way, perhaps. I completely agree. I'm very much happy that we can link virtually not only to the cyberspace because it was always present here. <laughs> so uh, it was not the, uh, just the question. It was maybe just the, also the complete readers uh, comments. So, uh, so we have Chicago School, we have Los Angeles School, and uh, we have Park School. And it seems that very soon we will have Moscow School of uh, uh, how to make uh, urban development further. So uh, maybe you know that there are uh, plans to make two centers in Moscow now. So you know, as uh, we have the historical center now, uh, Moscow is going to be uh, bigger due to the um, oblast uh, region, which is uh, going to, uh, to be uh, added to Moscow. So it's just a question to you. How do you think, is it possible to have not many centers or one center, but two centers in one city? And if it will be uh, realized, so... We have two capitals, you know, why not? Why so, two centers in one city? And maybe, uh, so it's a uh, good idea to analyze it after maybe two or five years, how it will be. And also it will be a useful Moscow school. And uh, your advice, so what would you, would you recommend to administration and to many administrations of other cities? What uh, should we do in this situation? So thank you. Uh, 
And thanks to the new literary observer, this is my first visit to Moscow. It's my first visit to Russia. I was in the former Soviet Union, but not in, not in, not in Russia. Since you know, it changed, I was only in the Baltic Republics, but not in Russia. Uh, you know, if I'm invited, I will hesitate to give any advice. I'll say, first, I have to spend a longer time here, understand what is going on. And really, this is a very difficult task. I might have some observations, but this shouldn't be real advice. The most advice should be based on the local people. I can talk with them, but I will really need to spend time studying and should this be here to understand the situation. And that'd be great if we get a tour. Uh, so if I have a time to tonight and tomorrow, so you can show me you know, what's, what is happening here and explain. As I start to think about what's going on in Moscow and how similar or different it might be from a trial. Los Angeles, or in Chicago. Thank you. Thank you so much.